Um, I'm John Irving, and Last Night in Twisted River is my 12th novel. You know, because I write all my first drafts in longhand, uh, in these lined uh, notebooks, uh, there's a, a certain excitement to me that that first blank page of paper doesn't know who you are. Uh, it, it has not read your previous works. So you feel, um, as naive as this sounds, you, you feel as if you're uh, starting a journey for the first time, whether it's the 10th or the 11th or the 12th time, uh, and whether or not the same obsessions that have haunted you for most of your writing life will once again show themselves. You still feel uh, it's a new adventure every time. I, I like that about the beginning process. Well, for 20 years, my wife argues more than 20 years, but I have trouble remembering more than 20 years. For 20 years at least, um, this story about a cook and his uh, pre-teenage son uh, has been in my mind. Uh, surprisingly, I knew quite a lot about this story as, as long as 20 years ago, but not enough to really get uh, started. I, I began and finished several novels that had been uh, in my mind uh, not nearly as long uh, because in their cases the last sentences came to me and uh, as you probably know I I never begin a novel uh, until I've written that last sentence. In, in 12 novels uh, not even the punctuation in those last sentences uh, has changed and and once I get that last sentence I can managed to make a kind of road map of the story, um, find my way back to where I think the book should begin. Uh, that's just been my process and, and continues to be my process. But in this book's case, there was something missing from what I knew, and I couldn't, for the longest time, I, I couldn't get that, uh, that ending clearly in mind, although I knew a lot about the story. I knew these two men were fugitives. I knew they would be on the run for 50 years. I knew that the story began in a kind of frontier justice sort of place. One law, a bad cop. Um, I knew it was close to the Canadian border. Uh, and most of all, I knew why the cook had this 12-year-old boy, because by the end of the novel, I knew that kid would have become a writer, and it would turn out that he was actually writing the very story we've been reading. That may seem like a lot to know to not get started, but I, I saw that there were things that had been kept from this boy that he didn't know, and I didn't know what those things were. Well, there are certain sentences along the way that seem pivotal, or fragments of sentences. There are certain phrases that I see as being of use somewhere in the story. Sometimes actual chapter titles, uh, sometimes locations. Um, it's not a very elaborate uh, roadmap. Um, it's really a bunch of uh, post-it notes that are either on the wall in front of me or on the desktop where I work so that I can put my finger on any one of those signposts when I you know, feel the need to. It's, it's basically the skeleton of the story. Uh, it's the action of the novel. When do the characters meet? Do their paths cross again? Do they live? Uh, do they die? If they die, when, where, how? Those kinds of things. Well, when I'm not um, interrupted by traveling or, or uh, school holidays for children, those kinds of things, um, uh, I, I get up pretty early. Um, I feed the dog. I'm usually at my desk, um, you know, uh, 7.30, 8 in the morning, and I work for eight or nine hours a day, um, and I work seven days a week. But there are a lot of interruptions. Um, I have three children. I have four grandchildren. I travel a lot. Uh, so I can't say that I work, um, you know, seven or eight hours a day, seven days a week, every week. But, but when I'm left my uh, own choices, that's what I do. 
Very, very little. Sometimes in the middle of the story, there are things that can be moved around. Um, the, be the beginning doesn't change much. The ending never changes. Uh, but sometimes in the middle of the story, uh, an event that I had imagined might be in the vicinity of the fifth or sixth chapter will actually end up being in the eighth or ninth chapter. So I take a little bit more uh, liberty with the... Um, chronology of events, the order in which I'm going to tell the reader certain things. I take more liberties with those things in the middle of the story, but they don't change. They're, it's just their placement that moves sometimes. I suppose I had a number of what I might call uh, pre-writing moments as a kid. Um, I recognized at a pretty early age, um, certainly I was pre-teens, uh, I noticed that the school day was enough of the day to spend with my friends. I seemed to have a need to want to be alone. Uh, even before I started um, uh, making almost landscape notes in a, in a journal, even before I started keeping a journal, um, which happened to me when I was 14, um, it, even before then, I had a need to come home from school by myself and to be in a room by myself or in my grandmother's garden by myself. I, I, I guess the earliest sign was how much I liked being alone, how much I actually needed to be alone, the way you need or, or I need exercise or food or a certain amount of sleep. The, there was that uh, desire to be and a comfort at being alone. It is a... well, there's there's a distinction to be made between the bears and the accidents, for example. Um, bears are just a, a sort of natural part of the landscape where I've lived most of my life. Um, uh, I live where there are bears. I see bears. Um, uh, the bear I saw most recently was swimming um, between one island and another. My wife and youngest son and I, we kind of followed it for a while in, in our boat. Um, uh, it, they don't seem, frankly, as special to me as they, as they do to many uh, of my readers. I, I, I've just kind of been around them. Um, I, I'm aware that they're there. Uh, there are other things, though, that um, are recurrent in my novels that are more on a level of uh, obsession. Um, I write very compulsively about what I fear. While there are many landmarks or signposts in my novels, factual things uh, that um, uh, did uh, cross my life or happened to me, um, those are the superficial autobiographical things in, that you see, I think, in many writers' novels. To me, what's more revealingly, uh, emotionally, psychologically autobiographical are those things in my novels that never happen to me, but which I dread and which I fear and which I hope never do happen to me or to the people I love. The constant uh, reappearance of the death of a child or the death of a loved one in a family. The idea that the more you fear losing someone, uh, the more likely in the story itself what you fear will happen. Um, these nightmarish things that reappear, um, that sort of haunt most of my novels, uh, as much as I control the plot, uh, the storyline of my novels, uh, I don't control those obsessions. Uh, obsessions, by definition, um, control you. I've been more successful as a writer than uh, I was um, as a wrestler. I, uh, I never won um, a major uh, tournament uh, in, as a wrestler. Uh, I got close, but anybody who's done any sport knows that that's um, close doesn't uh, make, uh, make you happy. Um, uh, I did it for a long time. Um, I competed as a wrestler for 20 years, from the age of 14 until I was 34. Um, 
maybe too long, given the arthritis in my uh, fingers and, and uh, uh, neck. Um, but um, uh, it was the first discipline I was exposed to. It, it was the first thing that I applied myself to with a tremendous amount of focus and determination. And as a young kid, you know, as, a, as an early teenager, you can be uh, more proficient athletically uh, at a younger age than you can ever expect to be proficient as a writer, uh, as a 14, 15, 16 year old. Um, my pursuits of wrestling and writing were simultaneous. Simul uh, uh, simultaneous. They happened simultaneously, simultaneously. They, they came together. I began writing and wrestling at the age of 14. But for a number of years, of course, um, I, I was rewarded as a wrestler. I could see my progress as a wrestler long before I recognized any um, discernible progress um, as, a, as a fiction writer. Um, but it was terribly useful to me um, to apply myself to this discipline. Uh, there was so much repetition involved that I think it has helped me, the wrestling, uh, as a writer, because of how much revision, rewriting, is a part of my writing process. And I think I have develop the stamina or the expectation that rewriting is part of the job and an essential part of the job. Uh, I think that comes from my training as, as an athlete. Well, in the case of a book that was in the back of my mind for as long as this one, 20 years, and yet I didn't write that last sentence until January of 2005. From the moment I got that last sentence and I began that roadmap we've talked about, and from the moment I started writing the actual novel, August of that same year, 2005, the writing of the first draft was rather quickly forthcoming. Um, uh, for me, very quickly, unusually quickly. Um, but certainly, more of my years as a writer are always spent rewriting than they are writing first drafts. Because I never begin a first draft until there is a plot uh, until I do know what happens to all of the characters. Uh, you might understand why those first drafts are pretty quickly forthcoming, but the rewriting process slows me down. And, and I, I like everything about the writing process that compels me to slow down, to keep it slow. I write all my first drafts in longhand because you can only write so fast in longhand. And on a keyboard, you just you can cover too much ground in too too fast a time, right? And I, I like to keep it um, slow, especially in that first draft uh, stage. And the longer the book you write, the more times you must pass through it, because uh, writers' voices change within a four or five year period of time. You're actually liking a different kind of sentence five years down the road than you were four years ago. And you, one, of the, one of the tasks of revising a novel of, of any length is to go back and make the whole thing sound as if it were spoken in one breath, uh, as if your sentence style, your preference for the semicolon or the parentheses or the dash just was constant. And you've got to make it look that way, even though it wasn't spoken in one breath. It was spoken in very halting little bits. Uh, it's supposed to sound like it's coming right off the top of your head. I don't know. I think that they're all um, uh, generated by um, uh, a kind of um, a compiled um, misunderstanding. Uh, I give... Um, I give Wolf the benefit of the doubt that, that he did not write that sort of white paper manifesto about how the rest of us should be writing the great American novel, uh, the piece he published in uh, Harper's, I believe, after um, Bonfire of the Banities was first published. Um, uh, I don't 
imagine when he wrote that, that, that he was aware of, of how many writers who'd been writing fiction um, longer and, and writing it better than, than, than he does uh, might have been offended by um, uh, that um, uh, prescriptive uh, uh, piece. Uh, maybe he didn't know. Uh, maybe he was just, uh, you know, speaking from the heart. Um, uh, and, and he didn't know it was, uh, it, it would be um, uh, irritating. Um, but uh, I, I know that um, that was the source of, um, uh, of, of what provoked um, me at him, and I know it was also the source of what provoked Updike um, uh, w with, with him, too. I remember a letter from uh, uh, John saying that he, he never would have... Um, uh, taken Wolf so much to task uh, in 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 that New Yorker piece, if it hadn't been for that earlier um, um, uh, manifest manifesto. But um, you know, I think it's an overrated um, uh, feud. Uh, he and I ran into each other. Uh, he was with his wife. I was with one of my children. We ran into each other um, on the Washington Mall. Uh, a few years ago, after all this uh, squabbling had been um, uh, much publicized, over-publicized, in my opinion, um, in the media. And um, I didn't think it was an especially um, uh, awkward or hostile meeting. I mean, we got through it without uh, spitting and scuffling or kicking dirt on each other's shoes. And, um, you know... Um, you you know they said um nice things to my son and i um I believe that we were both perfectly uh, cordial to to one another so it, not much of a feud in my opinion um there are certainly people that um you in the media don't know about that if i ran into them the more sparks would fly I'm not interested in reworking anyone else's notions. You know, I I think uh, everyone's entitled to 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 like uh, to prefer to um, um, bless the kind of uh, literature he or she um, uh, likes uh, uh, best. Um, I'm a, I'm just someone who says repeatedly the 19th century novel. Uh, is and remains the model of the form for me. It was Dickens, it was Hardy, it was Melville, it was Hawthorne. Those were the writers that made me want to be a writer. And when I read them as a teenager, um, what was the first thing in my unsophisticated way I latched onto? It was plot, of course. Uh, they wrote plotted novels. Um, usually about uh, developed characters who were developed over a not insignificant passage of time. There was also a kind of dramatic event or series of events uh, at the heart of the storytelling. But the plot was what engaged me. The plot was what made me want to become a writer in, in the first place. Um, I certainly liked Joyce's um, early stories. Uh, I love the portrait of the artist as a young man. Um, uh, the more internal, um, uh, uh, intellectually um, uh, favored uh, uh, stuff, um, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, um, uh, frankly, um, underwhelms me. Uh, but you have to remember that um, uh, no one, even when I was a teenager, no one contemporary uh, as a writer uh, much appealed to me. Um, no one even remotely modern um, much appealed to me. It was those 19th century storytellers uh, who wrote those mostly long, uh, richly detailed, uh, abundant with visual detail, if you consider uh, Hardy um, and, and Dickens especially, but also Melville. Um, it made me want to write... Um, uh, plotted, mostly long, uh, and lavishly detailed, uh, textured, uh, visually 
seeable um, novels. I've heard, um, and this is usually used uh, in a complimentary fashion, I've heard my writing described as cinematic. For someone like myself who really doesn't like the movies very much, I find that um, uh, a little strange. What the people who say cinematic when they describe my writing mean, uh, what they mean is that it's very visual, that, that it's very vivid. You can see what's going on. But I didn't get that from the movies. I got that from Dickens. I got that from Hardy. I got that from Melville. I got that from the way those 19th century writers composed. Um, <laughs> there, there was um, nothing uh, uh, minimalist about them. It's less what I don't like about movies as what I do like about the theater. It's, it's what I like better about plays. Um, before I was even sophisticated enough to read those long uh, 19th century novels, um, before I was a teenager, um, I saw quite a lot of theater. Uh, my mother was a prompter in a local um, uh, amateur theatrical society. Um, I spent quite a bit of time backstage where the prompter sits, and um, I saw some simply terrible plays, but also some pretty good ones. And I realized at a pretty young age that, you know, even a pre-teenager could see uh, a Sophocles play or a Shakespeare play, and failing to understand as much as a third or a half of the language, there was never any question about the story. You could see what was going on. Um, Shakespeare would not be such a burden uh, to the kids in school who are exposed to Shakespeare, to reading Shakespeare for the first time, if you could ask the kids to read a play uh, and then see a production. They'd get it. They'd really get it. Um, you know, you, you, you can miss a lot of the language um, and, uh, and see King Lear and know right away. Um, that, um, you know, that uh, two of those daughters are bad and one of them is good and Lear's got it all wrong. You know, you can, you can pick that up when you're 12 or 13 years old, even if you don't understand um, everything that they're saying. It's just that there's a kind of... The first movies that excited me, I did like westerns. Um, I liked the inevitability of violence that is a part of the western movie. Uh, naturally, I like uh, westerns. Oh, how many centuries from now might western movies be um, the most significant gift uh, to, to the culture of American storytelling? Who knows? I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, but I didn't really begin to like movies until I was in high school and I began to go to the nearby university town in Durham, where the University of New Hampshire was, where they had, you know, an art uh, cinema. And I got to see for the first time all those foreign films with subtitles and realized that um, there were some wonderful films um, out there, uh, many of them. In, indeed, for a time, most of them um, not American. Uh, and I, I like them, but there seems to be so much compromise uh, in the uh, film business uh, that um, why wouldn't you like um, the freedom and individual license that the playwright is granted uh, on stage and in the theater? Why wouldn't any writer like the theater uh, better? Writers aren't important uh, to the movie business or they're not valued, um, uh, whereas, um, you know, I think uh, playwrights um, uh, are, are still treated respectfully. You just have to be lucky to get a good film made at all. You just need to have a lot of luck. Um, I had an excellent experience with the Cider House Rules, but uh, it took 13 years to make that film. Um, four different directors uh, were involved. Uh, one died, I fired two, um, and uh, finally Lasse Hallstrom and I were put together and, and um, we clicked. We worked well together. Um, but um, a lot of things have to fall in place um, uh, in order to make a film uh, come off. Um, 
it was a great experience for me, that film, uh, its uh, success. Um, but nobody notices, much less rewards, uh, uh, the screenplay for a film uh, unless everybody else associated with the film makes the film uh, look good. If you don't have solid, across-the-board acting uh, performances uh, from your actors, nobody notices how good the screenplay might have been. If you don't have a good director, if you don't have a good art director, if you don't have a good editor and a good director of photography, nobody will know that it was a good screenplay. Um, so uh, you need a lot of help, is what I'm saying. You need a lot of help. If I were 27 and trying to publish my first novel today, I might be tempted to shoot myself. Um, uh, but I'm uh, 67 and I have an audience, so uh, I'm not especially worried about my future in the book business. But um, I think it's much harder to be uh, a young writer, uh, a writer starting out uh, today, than it was when, when I started out, when my first novel, uh, Setting Free the Bears, uh, was published uh, back in the late uh, 60s. Here was a novel that wasn't even set in this country. It was about a couple of Austrian students, and it had a, a historical section which was um, uh, easily half the length of, of the novel about the um, uh, Nazi and then Soviet occupation uh, of Vienna. Not a very American subject. Um, I remember years later asking the guy who uh, published that first novel if uh, he would uh, publish that novel if it came across his desk today. This was back in the 90s. Um, and my old friend and editor and, and publisher, what I saw was he hesitated too long. You know, he waited. He thought, oh God, how do I answer this one? And then he said, well, of course I would publish it today. And I said, no, you wouldn't. I saw the hesitation, and he laughed and said, no, of course I wouldn't. <laughs> Very telling, and I think it's, uh, it's a lot tougher uh, to be a first novelist, uh, to be an unknown novelist today, um, than it was uh, for me. And so I, I worry about what's going to happen with those good younger uh, writers. Um, but uh, I don't think the book uh, is in any particular uh, peril. I, I think the book uh, is, is going to survive. It's odd that I've written two novels out of 12 about Americans who leave this country and, and go and live in Canada and stay there, um, although uh, the characters who do that are, are very different, and their reasons for doing so are, are also different. Uh, the reasons are political in the case of Johnny Wheelwright, the narrator of A Prayer for Owen Meany. Um, he does hate his country. Um, that's not the case uh, for Danny Bacigalupo and his dad. Um, they're fugitives. They're running away. It's not their choice uh, to go to Canada, although it does become Danny's choice to stay. Um, I couldn't do that. Uh, I couldn't do it primarily uh, as a writer. I think if I'm going to continue uh, to pick on my country in some way as a writer, uh, I better live here. I, I, I better uh, be here firsthand. Um, and not as a, a, an expatriate. Um, so I would disagree with the Ketchum character uh, in Last Night in Twisted River when he tells Danny that um, uh, he should leave uh, th this country and, and stay away. Uh, I, 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 I would disagree with that um, in my case. Uh, in my case, too, unlike Danny, I have three children and four grandchildren. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I live part-time in Toronto because my wife is Canadian, um, but um, uh, I'm an American and I, I always um, uh, will be. I remember thinking in the last years of the Vietnam War that I would never see this country as divided uh, again as it was 
in those years. But I was wrong. I think um, we as a people are, are more divided today. Um, I think back in the latter years of the Vietnam War, it was chiefly that war that divided us. I don't think it's fair or enough to say that we are divided today because of, or only because of, the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. I think there are other deep political and cultural rifts in this country. Uh, conservative, liberal rifts, uh, religious and not religious rifts. I think there are any number of differences among Americans that uh, divide us um, angrily uh, and sharply. Uh, and, um, you know, boy, I, uh, uh, I, I really um, have the highest hopes uh, for uh, President Obama. I, um, uh, I'm very excited about him. But he has inherited such a mess, uh, such uh, a turmoil, that um, I hope people um, uh, will give him time uh, to sort it out and to undo at least some of the damage that George W. Bush did to this country. And um, I think I'm already too old to realistically imagine that even if Mr. Obama is hugely successful, that he can actually undo uh, all the damage um, George W. Bush uh, did to this country's reputation, to the way we are seen uh, outside of this country, to the way other people in the world uh, see us. Maybe that can be recovered or that reputation that we once had can be regained, that good reputation. Uh, maybe it will be regained in my children's lifetimes, but I, I don't expect uh, uh, to see it um, uh, happen. There is, of course, a lot of anti-Americanism around the world um, that is simply uh, hostile uh, and, and vehement uh, and um, uh, motivated um, by the desire to see any democratic way of life um, destroyed. Um, but there's another kind of anti-Americanism that we have um, contributed to. Uh, and uh, it, it, it embarrasses me. Um, uh, I'm, I am sick of seeing um, this country's uh, bully patriotism uh, used as a smokescreen and as a cover-up uh, uh, for things we haven't done right. My first child was born when I was still a college student. Um, I was an awfully young father the first time. Um, and I don't know if, if my age contributed to my um, uh, terror uh, that something might ever happen to this uh, child. Um, but having children in my life, uh, uh, having them be such a presence in my life for as long as they have been, um, uh, that boy was born when I was 22. I'm 67 now, and my 18-year-old uh, still lives um, under my roof in, in my house um, for another year before he's off to university. Um, and uh, that's kind of a long time uh, from the age of 22 to 67 uh, to have had one or more of my children living at home with me for all those years. It certainly has informed what I write about, how childhood and adolescence uh, are in 10 out of 12 of my novels, such um, 
uh, a vital part of the story. Uh, so I suppose it would surprise no one to think that my principal anxieties um, in my real life are uh, parental. They're anxieties um, for my children and by extension now uh, for my grandchildren and, um, and for my wife, for, the, for everyone I, I love. I, I, um, I'm a natural worrier. It, it's what I do for a living. I, I create characters that I'm very fond of and visit upon them the worst things I can imagine. It's, as you might well understand, it's, it's, it's hard not to do that when you leave your office. Um, you don't uh, have the opportunity to stick your imagination under your desk and say hello to it again in the next morning. It comes with you, right? It, it, it goes where you go. Um, so, with three children and four grandchildren, I have a lot to worry about um, before I turn my attention to the state of the world. But it's, it's not that that um, leaves me in, entirely uh, uh, at ease either.